uh, met a very ambitious young woman in the hotel who I got married to and happened to become my wife. Uh, so we were working eight, nine years I've only in the hotels and 26 I became the general manager, a full general manager of a large hotel, which was a dream, which is something I'd worked towards all my life. And at 26 I thought uh, the sense of accomplishment sort of overtook me. Uh, but then, like I said, life is about happy accidents, hopefully happy accidents. Uh, I'm asthmatic, uh, and I was in Bangalore, uh, and so the health was taking a turn for the worse. Uh, in comes my father-in-law, my wife's uh, uh, father, who had started this company. So he was an Air Force officer, again not an electronics guy, but if you remember, your dad would remember, uh, there was a license raj at one time, which meant that you could go to the government and say, can I make something, they would allow you to make only that much, because it was a protected, closed, controlled economy, which I'm sure Professor will tell you a lot about. So in that era, this gentleman decided, uh, after uh, taking his retirement from Air Force, so he was already 50 something, uh, he decided that he needs to do something on his own and be an entrepreneur. So he went to the Ministry of Electronics that was hot in 80s, uh, got a license, depending on how much money you had in your pocket, uh, for, uh, he managed to get his friends and family to put together one crore rupees, which was a lot of money in those days. Uh, and decided to make capacitors because that is what he could make. Fortunately, because of some connections, he had somebody said, well, we won't make TVs, you can, we can get you a license for televisions, which would have made the company a completely different thing, but then the amount of money you needed was more. Long story short, he got a license to make 10 million capacitors a year. <coughs> if you make more than 10, you would be in jail. Right. So that is in 84. Uh, my mother-in-law was then alive. Uh, unfortunately, we lost her. And this lady on a typewriter, decided to start writing letters to people that there was no Google, so you don't know who makes capacitors, but good old way of research and found some companies that were making capacitors in the world. A lot of them happened to be in Japan. So she wrote these letters, literally old, envelope style, put a stamp, put it in the letterbox, waited for a month, praying that something would work out. And fortunately, a company in Japan called Okaya responded and said, sure, we'd like to work with you. And they came and they signed a technical collaboration in those days. They gave us four machines and brought us out of it and we were capacitors. We were nowhere in the picture. I was happy uh, flirting with my to be wife, probably at that point of time or pretty much all that. But then, uh, so this was 92, 93 that I'm already talking about. So Mr. Jay Kumar, the, now the chairman of the company, my father in law comes to Nagro, visiting us uh, just on a short holiday and figures that I'm not having a very good time with my asthma in Bangalore, while of course. So he says, okay. so I curiously, just out of courtesy, I said, what do you do? And what is your business about? And I have no idea. So he told me what he was doing in Dickey, and it was a company with 40 people making these capacitors. He says, journey so far has been quite good. Uh, we make profits, and we make good quality capacitors. We have a decent customer base. Uh, but things are about to change. Uh, because 92 is when uh, Mr. Manmohan Singh was the finance minister, and they announced this whole liberalization. I read about it in papers, but as I would tell you, I don't care much about what that would mean to people like us. It was too young to do this, or I thought it, it was not my area of concern. But uh, the more I talked to him, I realized and he realized that this was actually going to be a, a, a fork in the road, as you say. So either for him, because he was only 50 something, uh, either he sells that company off, uh, monetizes it, and sits back and retires. Uh, or he gets ready for global economy. Right. So the threat was that capacitors were imported into the country, I think, at about 65% import duty. So if, if uh, somebody in the world was making a capacitor for a rupee, anybody who wanted that capacitor in India had to pay one rupee 65 pesos. So if somebody like us was making the same capacitor in India, we also had to pay some duty on our raw material. But we could make it maybe for one to be a one to be 20 by say because we were not that competitive and still had a nice headroom uh, to make a kind of property work. That headroom was going to go away. That's what trade liberalization meant to a businessman. So why I'm saying that is a, it might mean many things to many people, but to a person making capacitors it basically meant you're going to die. Because either you find a way in which you can bring down your selling price every year by 10 to 15 percent while the only other surety we had was that costs will go up every year by 10 to 15 percent. Everybody wants an income, electricity will cost you more, probably raw material will cost you more. So 
There is nothing that's going to cost you less, but your capacity has to be sold at a cheaper and cheaper price. So if you draw a graph of your sales coming down and your costs going up, there is a point where you meet uh, what we would call in business language as the break-even point. So from a profit-making company, you would become a break-even company in some year, and then every year after that would be a loss, right? That's not a happy picture to do, right? So this was the cross point that we met. We actually met and started talking about it. Unless you found a way of increasing that sales price, which cannot be done by sales price. So what do you do? Differentiation product, I've never heard of it. I've never heard of that when I was 26. I felt it, but I didn't know that. But that was a difficult thing for me. Because your customer was somebody who made a television. He was used to buying your 30 capacitors and making a television. That was BPA, or Orida, or Crown in those days. Right? So what differentiation can you make to him? He's already using your capacitor. He's happy with your quality because he doesn't know any other quality to start with. Yeah, there are only two, three people making in India. So everybody, first of April, calls up each other saying, sir, if there's a price for so you increase the price list every year, give it to your customers. They have no choice but to buy it. The customers are not very unhappy because they also give you and me as a citizen a new price list saying, Last budget, now the costs have gone up, so everything is going to increase. So those were the happy times, right? Uh, 93 onwards, this was going to change. We knew that in 2005, actually, uh, uh, capacitor duty became zero. So that means since 2005 to now, 13 years, every capacitor we sell is globally competent. I compete with China on price, with Japan on quality, with Germany on reliability, because as a citizen, as a buyer of capacitors in this country, he has Enormous choice. And then there is internet, there's Google, there's eBay, so you can order it from wherever you want. Uh, there are platforms that make it available. So this was an extremely interesting journey for me, partly because it was very, very challenging. Uh, so if I if I put it on a graph, uh, is that something that you use? Yeah, okay. So what I told you first, so if you look at a so this was typically the Normal sales curve would be going up like that, but now 92 onwards, it starts coming down like this. The cost curve also in this case was also going up somewhere like this, and they were making a steady profit. But now because this does not continue to come down, this continues to go up. This is the point where we start making losses. The challenge was to bring this down. Uh, the sales thing somewhat take this up while trying to bring the cost down. 40 people who have only one way of working same customers, and that is where that journey began. Um, we are happy that the journey went very well. Those 40 people have become 640 people. Each one of those persons has actually created 16 jobs. So I always tell them, you are as much an employer as I am. Right? And if these 640 people do the same good job that those 40 people did, then they will do another 16 X jobs. That means you'll be a 10,000 people now. That is our dream. That is our shared vision in the company. We start every morning at 9 o'clock, we have a 24 hour operation. But if you are there now at 9 o'clock, they have a prayer. We take a pledge every day to create those 10,000 jobs. So the prayer is to create extremely good level of customer delight, conserve our environment, learn from our mistakes, spread happiness to whoever we meet, share our knowledge and wisdom, and create a sustainable company that will create many, many such jobs. That is Sum and total of what we try to do. How do you convert 40 people into 40 employees into 640 employers? That to me is a story of HR. Yeah? It is how you look at that. So, what does HR stand for? Sorry? Human? Human resources. How would you like to be called? What is your name, sir? Marash, if I were to call you as resource 134 in my company, how would that feel? So that's what human resources does. That's what the human resource manager looks at you as. He doesn't look at you as Marash anymore. He looks at you as my resource 134. Like an engineer, a chief engineer looks at, I have 600 machines in our factory. My chief engineer looks at machine 123. And he always, when saying, oh, but machine 123 is down again, it has a very long downtime. So he starts firing his junior engineer saying, well, the head is not, it's not prepared since yesterday. Okay. 
So the first thing that I want you to understand is, it is our mindset, not the mindset of only the leader. Of course, the leader has a big influence on any organization. However, it's each one of us, our mindset on what does that word HR mean to us. Now, hopefully by the end of the, the hour, I will give you another definition of HR. But this is what the world looks at. You are a resource, like a machine. A car is supposed to give me a mileage of 10 kilometers per liter. How much mileage will you give me? That's the kind of key result area that is being created. Because everybody in the sales team will get the same care. Make 10 sales calls every day. Right? Every quarter I want you to sell 1 crore rupees worth of stuff. I want you to get a gross profit of 20%. Whatever. Three gears. And that's how you will be judged. And that's how you, when you become HR manager, will begin to judge your people. But that's not how life works. 